We're back. We're live 10 o'clock block on a given Monday. I'm Jake Fidel. This is Think Tech Hawaii. And this is the middle way. We're talking about uh, China students in Minnesota. Uh, Minnesota, the middle of the country. You'd think the China students would be on the West Coast, the East Coast, but not true. Okay. And we have Becky Fillinger going to talk to us about it. And Joan Brzezinski is going to talk about it. And Becky is going to introduce Joan, all from the University of Minnesota. Becky, can you please introduce Joan? Jay, I'd be thrilled to, and thank you for kicking off the program. Uh, Joan Brzezinski is the executive director of the China Center at the University of Minnesota. As director of the China Center, Joan has assisted the state in their discussions with Hanban regarding a state level visiting teachers program. She has developed a number of professional development seminars and meetings for Chinese language teachers throughout the state and Joan has worked with school districts to bring quality Chinese language programming to schools to enhance Chinese cultural offerings. Joan has made more than 30 trips to China and has visited most major regions, including uh, throughout China, but also Hong Kong and Taiwan. Joan, thank you very much. I could have gone on and on, but there's a lot to say. And let's well, hear Becky, more what, about what is the Chinese scope of the show? Can you the give scope, us a handle on what we're going to talk about? Yes, here? the scope of the show uh, will focus on the Chinese students at the University of Minnesota, how they've been coming to the university for over 100 years, what that has meant to the students and the university and to the relationships between uh, the state and the country of China. Wow. OK, John, welcome to the show. Nice to have you here. Uh, Joan, tell us tell us about your program, the challenge, uh, and tell us how long you've been involved in it and what you do for it. Okay, so I um, direct the China Center at the University of Minnesota, and that uh, center has been at the university since 1979, and its mission is to facilitate exchange between the University of Minnesota faculty, students, and scholars, and to promote understanding um, for. Uh, Minnesotans and U.S. people um, on China, as well as um, right, remote understanding of Chinese people of the U.S. So our, our goals are um, to really do um, a lot of uh, public diplomacy and a lot of exchange with China in order to build those bridges. Okay, well, um, I guess the university has a special pension for this since it's been doing it for so long. Um, why? Why is the university interested in bringing Chinese students over and having this program? Well, um, <clears throat> the history of the you know, Chinese students at the university started rather early. We'd have over 100 years of exchange with China. Um, our uh, exchanges began in 1914. Um, the US in general um, had uh, begun its relationship with China bringing students over in uh, 1872. The um, first 120 students came as a part of a Chinese education mission from the Qing dynasty. That uh, exchange didn't last very long and the government uh, sort of was toppled and a, rep a republic was established in 1912. And then in 1914, our students um, came in the second wave of Chinese students uh, that uh, was primarily funded by the Boxer Indemnity Scholarships. So those uh, students arrived from um, Shanghai and they came here to study um, mining primarily. And um, they were here uh, for a short time on campus and they were part of a group of about 700 students that came under that program um, during those early years in 1900. And fast forward 100 years, the University of Minnesota has been in the top 10 of uh, university institutions related uh, receiving Chinese students. And I think one of the reasons for that is uh, the university has always been strong in programs and degrees that Chinese students want to pursue. Um, in the early 1900s, that would have been mining and agriculture. And in the mid 1900s, it would have been engineering and mining and agriculture. And then towards the, 19, uh, the 20th century, the end of the 20th century, um, those degrees changed to business and computer science. And in the 2000s, here we're looking at students that are coming for a lot of health sciences um, and other types of uh, pursuits, including management and other degrees in which universities had um, tremendous strength over this last um, 100 years. These undergraduates or graduates? And if so, you know, what percentage of them are, are PhD candidates? 
Okay, so um, since uh, I guess I don't know when how we started counting that, um, but uh, the Chinese students primarily in the early days um, since 1979, let's say when we resumed our exchanges with China, were primarily um, scholars and graduate students. Uh, the undergraduate student population didn't really begin to grow until like 2010. And at that point in time, well, I mean, they had been bits and pieces here and there and little few students coming um, on mostly private funding. And in 2010, uh, the students, uh, undergraduates and the graduate students sort of flipped. Um, and from then on 2010 through today, uh, the greater number of students on campus are undergraduate students. Oh, you know, we live in times that are different than 20 years ago. Uh, 20 years ago, my observation, I, I haven't made, you know, 9,000 trips to China like you, um, but, but I have made three. And uh, in the early 2000s, uh, it was all optimism and light and, um, and hopefulness and, you know, building better bridges, so to speak, uh, you know, finding relationships, uh, exchanging, you know, students both ways and professionals both ways. Yes. I, I was involved in some of that and I, I remember the optimism. So now maybe it's not so optimistic. I think Donald Trump had an effect on things and um, you know the whole you know isolationist movement in this country, including Minnesota, uh, has probably changed that. And the immigration policy and visas and the like has probably changed that. Uh, so query, how has it changed that, if at all, in the past 20 years? It would seem to me that you know you you have headaches that you didn't have 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the challenges for students to come to the U.S. have um, increased over the last five years, let's say. Um, and those challenges are certainly on the visa level, how to get a visa to come to the United States. Certainly the pandemic has had a tremendous impact on uh, student mobility, um, students going abroad and students coming from international countries to the U.S., um, the Chinese population, um, I would say, uh, from about 2014 to um, in 2018, 2019, had been very stable. We had about 2,500 Chinese students in, on campus, and that population is a little bit um, around 40%, I would say, of our total international student population. We, as a university, had a philosophy that we didn't want to over-recruit from one area of the world and keep a balance of students. And, and because Chinese people make up about 40% of the world's population, it seemed about right to keep that percentage there. So um, it's from 2018 though, going forward um, with the uh, changes to visa, visa um, rules and the uncertainty that was presented by a number of executive orders on whether or not students would be able to complete their degrees, if they had to return home every year to get a new visa to come back, not being certain whether or not they could or they couldn't. And um, also the sort of threats to, I think, um, the uh, curriculum practical training and the optional practical training programs that students can take advantage of while they're in the country to, to gain some experience working for a company or an, uh, an, an institution that um, is in their, their field. And so they can take that experience and then go on to further their careers elsewhere. Those um, programs were often under threat, I would say. Um, nothing really actually happened to the programs, but they, there was constant discuss, discussion at the political level about what to do about these programs and maybe shut them down. So I think when students are planning their degree program and they can't see a clear path, um, one to graduation and then after graduation, it causes them um, certainly some hesitation before they commit to a, a fairly expensive overseas degree, right? So um, there's that. And then um, I think recently um, in, in certain areas, um, students, especially in STEM and other areas have higher um, scrutiny um, from the visa offices and the um, political, and I, I wouldn't say, pol I would say policies uh, on, on terms of what schools they come from, that kind of thing. And that may deter a number of students as well. But um, in general, I would say there have been a lot of obstacles to uh, student participation. But I would say that we've been very pleased um, 
previous this year during the pandemic, um, we did primarily online for those students that weren't able to get visas and come um, online and remote learning. Um, this year, they're they're all welcome to come here. I know visa processes were delayed and lengthy, but um, a lot of students have arrived. I'm waiting for this year's enrollment numbers. I don't have them yet, but um, we think that you know, although I'm sure there's been a fairly good drop in the number of students, but we still have a healthy population on campus. There must be a certain amount of competition in this area, you know, because in fact they pay tuition. Um, and I imagine that, um, you know, if you're a parent in Beijing or um, Shanghai, and you say, hmm, I want my kid to go to Stanford, Harvard, Yale, what have you, the, you know, the big national schools. Um, I, I, I don't want him to go to a, a school in the middle of the country that is not Harvard and Yale and Stanford. Um, and I imagine that's competition for you. Also, it seems to me that the United States has made itself less attractive to a Chinese uh, family, wants to send their kid to an American school, maybe they'll mm, decide on another country. Maybe, you know, they take, I know that for the, the lawyers who take LLMs, I'm familiar with that, you know, they'll, they'll go to Britain just as quickly. Uh, they'll go to Canada and uh, that'll help them in the practice back in, in China. So, I mean, what about competition? What's your thought about competition? What is the reality about competition? between American schools and between, um, you know, American schools and schools in other countries? Well, I can't speak specifically to um, the competition and recruitment kind of uh, scenario. I can tell you that, yes, the Chinese have far more options today than they ever have in terms of overseas schools. Um, university, uh, I would say the university ranks quite highly globally, but other universities have really um, also improve their rankings globally. So I think they have lots of options. Um, well, I think it's incumbent on a university to really think about the students that they're recruiting um, so that it's not, we're not competing with Yale and Harvard. Those students are not coming to the University of Minnesota, but we are competing with University of Michigan and Wisconsin and Illinois and maybe UCLA or, or University of Hawaii. <laughs> um, I'm not really, um, certain what attracts them, but I know that, you know, in certain areas, we have to really um, identify the students that one fit well for the University of Minnesota, that the programs are the strongest for them, but they are the strongest for our programs. And so I think our recruitment, our efforts in terms of um, our Chinese students have always been sort of really focused on trying to get to that group or that, that, that student population that is high quality, but is also a good fit for the university. What's the special sauce that you offer? I mean, aside from the academic, I mean, is, is it housing? Is it the weather? Is it the excellent pizza <laughs> parlors downtown? Uh, what, what, what is it that uh, you, you, you believe they come for? Well, I think for a major um, tier one research university, we're kind of unique, and I wouldn't say all together unique, but uh, in that we are on urban campus. And um, we sit very nicely in between the two cities, St. Paul and Minneapolis. We have um, access to all sorts of um, museums, entertainment and sporting and um, the usual sort of American cultural sort of feel. And I think those things, as well as um, I, we have at least 10 Chinese restaurants on campus. So, I mean, I think that little bit of home as well as the sort of cosmopolitan and urban environment that they get when they're here um, is uh, a draw. I also think for um, the families of the Chinese students that are coming, they, um, you know, they're looking at safety. I mean, the, every city has its issues and certainly Minneapolis isn't a city that doesn't, but um, I think overall um, they feel comfortable with um, the on-campus safety and on-campus environment. So it's, uh, those are, I think, our special sauces and draw, and just our Midwestern friendliness. People are, you know, very, very kind and, and open to, I think, um, foreign guests. The heart of America. So, Becky, yes. how much of what Joan has said so far do you agree with? And also, what would you add to what Joan has said so far? Uh, I think I agree with you, Joan, and I'm, I'm, you, I loved your question, Jay, about the secret sauce. I'm thinking after 100 years, there's probably also a number of legacy students 
who come to the university because family members did. Um, I think that the university has a center in China. So there's a presence there that leads people to have a familiarity with Minnesota. So they know about it, they want to come. Um, and I was interested in more of the recruiting activities, Joan. What exactly happens in terms of recruitment? Um, well, it's changing because of the pandemic in <laughs> China. Travel is not really um, consistent. So instead of visiting high schools and talking and presenting to students um, in person, a lot of that's now being done online, which has got um, good and bad to it, only from the standpoint is um, before the online or sorry, the in person. Uh, recruitment um, seminars were largely um, on the shoulders of our two people in the Beijing office. But uh, now, um, when we go to this online format, we can always bring in colleagues from the main campus so that they can hear directly from people in international students and scholars office or the, um, you know, the college, uh, college recruiter that they want to talk to is right there. So that, that works really well. Um, it also benefits family members because when, you know, when the programs are at school, the parents don't always get to attend. So they get to attend these online programs and that makes them happy. I think that's really good. We also have shifted to a more of a training model for high school counselors. And so um, our um, staff in the Beijing office works really closely with uh, Education USA, which is uh, uh, embassy university, or uh, sorry, US embassy, um, program, but um, they do a lot of interaction with high school counselors that are, are counseling kids that want to go international so that we have them understand more about the University of Minnesota. They can clearly uh, present it to their students. And then um, there's a, you know, a connection that we can make that way too. Um, Jay, we've had governors who have led trade missions to China. And I know that part of those trade missions have included emphasis on the research capabilities of the University of Minnesota, which Joan alluded to. So that's another feature that our global top corporations in conjunction with government support and the university, it, it's a compelling package when you put all of that together. Joan also mentioned safety as a feature uh, or a reason why a student might come. And I did some research before we started that there were 3,800, I believe, incidents of anti-Asian racist incidents in Minnesota, I think over the last year. Um, Joan, I'd like to know if the university is addressing that type of incident. Oh yes, um, this was obviously something that's very important to the China Center and our work, but also is important to um, all of our colleagues across the um, the system. And, um, you know, as Asian hate has presented itself, either in Minnesota or other places, um, the university has responded with messages of support and um, resources for those students uh, who have- How do you stop these incidents? You prosecute? Um, I don't know how much prosecution has been going on. Um, I know that in some of the cases, um, especially like just recently, there was a, a, a defacing or vandalism of a Hmong cultural center in um, St. Paul that, you know, these, these cases certainly are being prosecuted. Um, you know, it just, um, there are just so many different types of incidents and I, I can't comment on, on the research that Becky's done, nor can I comment on specific incidents. But I can say that we have um, campus um, resources for these students to, um, to uh, find uh, support and counseling, as well as uh, the China Center and the International Student Scholars Office has um, presented two um, talking and listening sessions for AAI, AAPI staff and for students. Um, that was uh, earlier this last spring. And then um, there has been a number of community um, organizations that have gathered together to also um, present programs on this. So I think there is a, a large um, number of people doing as much as they can, and it isn't an issue that um, is very Sure. Well, how do the Chinese students feel about it? I mean, and, and by the way, it's not just Minnesota, it's the country. 
Yeah. All they got to do is open the newspaper on any Monday morning and they'll see that, you know, things happening all over the place. Sometimes more coverage, sometimes less, but there's a baseline of this sort of thing all over the country. I mean, are they angry? I'm angry, but, but that's just me. I don't know how you guys feel. You're probably angry too. How do the Chinese students feel? I would say they're worried and they're apprehensive. They don't necessarily feel as welcome as they they have when they first came or if they've just arrived, they don't really know how to navigate some of that. Um, it's, it's difficult, I think, coming from a cultural majority to a cultural minority. And so it is also that experience that I think sort of sets them apart. And so that I obviously more conversation and dialogue with them to, to help them feel that they're welcome and, and they have a place on campus, I think is important in the messaging that comes from our president and deans and other um, you know, leadership at the university is important. But well, I, tell I, them that, tell them there's a lot of people in the country who care about them and want them to have a good experience here. And if you ever want to put them on a talk show with us, we're happy to tell them in person. Okay. Um, I wanted to ask you about, um, you know, exchange programs, you know, because uh, it, it should be, in my view, uh, both ways. Uh, we had a show with a fellow last week who uh, went to, uh, he went to speak, uh, he went to spe uh, teach English uh, in Shanghai. And uh, he was there two years, right on through COVID, right through, only mm -hmm. came back a week or two ago, had a great experience and it was a great discussion. And now he's fluent in Mandarin which I expect you are too, Joan, I would expect that. Yeah, all, all right, you know, right. okay. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, my point is though that, you know, you really like to see it going both ways. If they come here and we send a certain number of students out of the University of Minnesota back there. So now you have a diplomatic connection, regardless of what governments do, students make great diplomats. Uh, is this happening? Um, it was. I think right now it's hard to travel to China because there's so much in the quarantine and um, you get there, you have to spend three weeks before you can get out the hotel door. So that that is a challenge right now for students. But um, frankly, um, yes, the university has a lot of different programs for students to travel overseas. Our learning abroad participation rate is huge. Um, we also do a number of what we call custom programs where faculty lead um, student groups to China. They complete part of their coursework in China with their faculty. And it is a really popular thing to do. And uh, hundreds of students participate in that type of fashion. The old traditional spend the study year abroad sort of thing isn't really a thing anymore, but um, students will go for semesters and for other things. And the University of Minnesota has a Chinese language flagship program which is a US government sponsored um, language initiative that comes from um, National Security Agency through uh, the, uh, I've forgotten. Um, and it is a program to develop high level fluencies in Mandarin in a particular um, degree and so, or a field of study. And so those students have done tremendously well and they spend a ton of time both in Taiwan and China and other places. So it is, it's quite, it's quite, robust that way. Well, so you're happy to include Taiwanese students in this program too? Oh yeah. yeah. And yeah. the mainland Chinese, do they have trouble with that? No, generally not. I mean, everyone is at the university to study their degree and their, their thing. And um, I think the political conversation is left for other times, but, um, and then I would say that the China Center also developed a China Bridge Challenge in this last year because we saw the students weren't arriving and we also saw students weren't going. We wanted them to be able to connect with each other across the internet and follow um, a topic and, and present on a solution to a, a con, uh, an issue or a, a challenge that both the US and China um, uh, face. And we had six teams of students. All of them had to have at least one international Chinese student um, on their team and uh, they, uh, they competed with this case competition. And it was a really tremendously successful, I think, um, presentation. We plan to do it again this next year and um, excited to try to, like I said, build that cross-cultural team promotion and communication and get them working together so that even if they can't be in the same classroom, they can work together on a, a similar That's project. great. Do they, do they is their living arrangements, um, you know, diverse, or do they hang out with each other? Um, do you do you take any steps to in, intermingle them? 
Um, you know, <clears throat> there are um, obviously there are programs like honor programs and things like that nature that students tend to, tend to live in the same dorms if they're in that same program. And I'm sure the Chinese students participate as that as well. And like most students, when they arrive on campus, they live in a dorm with other students and probably um, non-Chinese or you know roommates from opposite ends of the world. And then uh, after after that, though, um, many students move off campus, and then they might move into a, an apartment with other Chinese students. But um, I think uh, the university, especially our international students and scholars office, work on a myriad of ways to try to connect students across cultures and um, involve them in um, different programs. One of the things that comes to mind is they have a world coffee hour where um, students representing um, different countries take a, take a responsibility to develop a program. Oh, that's great. That's wonderful. Yeah. Becky, I'd like you to address one area, if you would, with Joan. Okay. And that is, what do these, these students do after? Do they head right back to China? They stick around? They get jobs? Like, you know, I'm thinking of uh, Chang Wang. He's made a life in the United States. So how many of them do that? How many of them um, are able to get through whatever immigration obstacles there are and get a job and make a life and have a family and buy a house and all that? And how many just go back? Why don't you, why don't you ask Joan that question? <laughs> I'd love to ask her that, Jay. Joan, do you have a way, do you know how many of the students who go through the University of Minnesota are able to stay in the United States, to establish a career, to spend their life in the United States? What, what do we know about them once they leave the university? Well, as I mentioned earlier, there are these uh, programs called uh, curriculum practical training and um, optional practical training and students can stay up to a year after their degree is concluded to work in a company or institution to work in their field. At that point, um, should they want to continue to be in the United States, they have to have an employer that wants to give them an H-1B visa, a working visa. And so that's really up to them and the employer and whether they choose to stay or not is really probably a function of whether or not they get that offer, but it may be also be a function of whether or not there's a better offer in China. And many um, companies are international or global companies. And so a, you know, a Medtronic may hire a student here to employ them in China because they have that ability to do this. And a lot of these companies across the world if they're hiring. So it's really difficult to say because, you know, in the 1980s, people stayed because they could and they had opportunities to stay. It was more of a, um, they didn't see a, um, a, a better offer or a good enough offer um, in China or with a company over there. And so they would stay. But nowadays, um, most Chinese students do their training and then they kind of return to China either through international employment or just to go back and work a job in China because China's economy um, over the last several decades has really um, grown and in the last recent years has really been booming. So there's a lot of opportunities for them um, that you know may not even exist here. You know, uh, Joan, I'm, I'm just wondering, uh, you know, uh, one question about the future, always about the future, you know, and the future depends on, you know, the administration in Washington, depends on the relationship between the US and China, which has a certain amount of friction right now. Um, and your program, for that matter, all the programs in the country relating to Chinese students are, are you know, a function of that relationship. Um, and so you have to keep your eye on that ball. And you have to make plans around that ball. And you have to be thinking about how, what the future of the relationship is, so you can plan the future of the program. What are your thoughts? <laughs> I don't have a crystal ball. Um, I I think like um, I think you've mentioned this earlier in our little chat before the program started. China's not going anywhere, and um, certainly um, there are a lot of uh, universities in China that are are very good universities and students. Um, will attend them, but I think there are good universities here as well. And um, I think the option to go to the best university you can will always be in the Chinese student's mind. And if that university happens to be in the University of Minnesota, then great. Um, and then we welcome them. 
And if it's in England, um, that's fine too. I think, um, I think the higher education um, uh, field will be uh, competing for, um, uh, like you said, competition being much greater across universities, across countries, be competing for a more finite group of students. And I think that those students have lots of options. So our goal should be to be the best that university that they can attend and, and attract those students. Well, it strikes me that Chinese students, um, like immigrants in general, work hard. They study hard. They're into achievement. That's their life experience up to the point they arrive in Minnesota. And so they, they, they help the university by raising the bar, raising the intensity of their work, their study, their research, and so forth. So it's attractive. They're attra as a group, it would seem to me they're very attractive because they make for a better university to have them around. Do you see it that way? Yeah, I think international students, but Chinese especially, um, make it a better university. We want to welcome diverse ideas and, and people from all over the globe to come in to enrich our campus, enrich our dialogue, and to give our students um, who are homegrown um, in, information about global society and, and the things that they'll need to know to enact and work with people across the globe. So I, I think building global competencies requires having a healthy and diverse international student population on campus. And that really means China too. You know, we have to have a lot of really excellent Chinese students here and we're, we, we work to get that done. Yeah, but this country ought to be involved in entertaining them, um, <clears throat> accommodating them, teaching mm -hmm. them, giving them a career when they want one, a life in the US. And we ought to find places, including China, where we can send our young people um, to learn about the world. Travel is broadening. But before we get on to the summary here, I just want to tell you a short story. A friend of mine, um, after high school, went to China. He was a very um, adventurous fellow. He went to China. And he learned Mandarin and he drove a taxi cab until the authorities found him. And they said, no, 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 no. You cannot be here driving a taxi cab without appropriate approvals. You have to go now. And he said, where, where would I go? They said, why don't, you, why don't you go to Taiwan? Go to Taiwan. He says, I can't go to Taiwan. I don't speak Thai. <laughs> True story. Okay, we're, we're out of time, Becky. Can you summarize and add your thoughts to this? And, and then yes. we got to go. Yes, the University of Minnesota is celebrating 107 years of welcoming Chinese students to the campus. The degrees over time have changed from mining and agriculture and engineering to still include those, but to be broader and include business and computer science and health sciences. What started out as a program for scholars and graduate students has broadened to include a greater number of undergraduate students at this time. Um, there are challenges today. There are visa challenges. There are pandemic challenges. Uh, Joan and her program are overcoming those, keeping the prog program strong through bridge programs and practical education. The university is competitive. It's not Harvard or Yale, but we are a very strong competitor in recruiting international students because we know that international students makes a better campus. It raises our visibility and um, our credentials. And we hope to see another hundred years of the students coming. Amen to that. Yeah. And my one phrase in Mandarin is Trey Dao Chu Chung which means we will find a way, okay? Cheshire <laughs> to both of you, and Sai Jian. Thanks for coming on Think Tech. Aloha. Thank you.